In 1970, barely six years after Zambia's independence, the first women's rights conference was organized. At the conference, one woman stood up confidently and reassured Zambian men that no overthrow of male authority or tradition was intended. On the contrary, she defined the new role of women as custodians of happiness and security in the home and as watchdogs of morality in Zambian society. Her name was Betty Kaunda and she was the most powerful woman in the country at the time. Beatrice Betty Kaunda was born on November 17, 1928, to Kawechi Banda and Milika Sakala at Timpika. Her father was a storekeeper for a popular chain store called Mandala. Betty grew up in Impika town, where she started her school at the age of 11. She later went to Mbereshi, where she completed her studies, returning to Mpika in 1946. After schooling, her father wanted her to travel to southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, to study nursing, but the mother had other plans. In 1946, Helen Kaunda took notice of Betty while visiting her parents' home and chose her as a bride for her last-born son, Kenneth. The couple's first meeting was quite memorable. Betty described him as a tall, handsome, smart-looking boy in a scout's uniform. But there was one more thing about the young Kenneth that enchanted Betty, and that was his ability to play the guitar. It was always Betty's dream to get married to a teacher, and on August 26, 1946, Betty's dreams came true when she and Kenneth Kaunda tied the knot in what was the first ever white wedding in the small town of Umpika. Betty's father, who was a hunter, had gotten permission from the district commissioner to fire his rifle into the air to celebrate his daughter's wedding. According to Betty, the gun salute was the best moment of the entire ceremony. Unfortunately, there was not a single photograph to show the couple's happy union. The only man supposedly taking photos at the wedding turned out to be a swindler who didn't have any film in his camera. In August 1951, barely five years into their marriage, Kaunda was dismissed from his teaching job at Luwa due to his political activism. After his dismissal, he was offered the post of Provincial Organizing Secretary of Northern Rhodesia by the Northern Rhodesia African National Congress, marking the beginning of his political career. In his new appointment, Kaunda personally traveled around the district on his bicycle with his guitar strapped to his back, stopping to sing hymns and discussing politics with tribal chiefs and others, and establishing branches of the Congress. Meanwhile, while her husband was busy organizing for the Congress, Betty Kaunda remained home to ensure that the family needs were met, especially those of their children. To support the family and her husband's political work, Betty and her husband began a small trade in second-hand clothes from Congo, locally known as Salaula. Nearly each time her husband and other nationalists were away, colonial authorities offered her and other wives bribes in the form of food and money to dissuade her husband from his anti-colonial activities. Betty and the others took the bribes but never yielded to their accompanying demands. This led to several threats being issued against Betty and other women but to no avail. In 1954, life had become tough for the Kaunda family, and Betty resorted to making and selling charcoal to support her family while the first-born son, Panji, worked as a caddy at Lusaka Golf Club in between school to supplement his mother's efforts. Betty took the role of motherhood seriously, and she kept the family together through some great difficulties during the struggle for independence, which finally happened in 1964. In his book, Letters to My Children, Dr. Kaunda acknowledged the fact that he spent little time home and that it was Betty who bore much of the burden of raising their children. As first lady, Betty Kaunda hated the limelight and chose to play a supportive role to her husband. Despite her distaste for blaring sirens, clicking cameras, and presidential motorcades, Betty had a larger-than-life presence in the country and internationally, and was always a step behind her husband, though ensuring not to interfere with his political work. She rather focused on advising him on matters concerning the family and the home. Betty Kaunda was also a woman of high taste and class. Though she lived a relatively simple life and never gave in to extravagance, she often made shopping trips to London, where she had her chitenge suits made by Ghanaian tailors. 
On Dr. Kaunda's request, she had completely abandoned her Western suits and became more Afrocentric. She equally advised her fellow women to dress modestly and to avoid mimicking foreign outfits. President Kaunda and Betty were also considered frontrunners in the fight against HIV and AIDS in the country, especially after they lost their son Masuzio, who succumbed to AIDS in the mid-1980s. Another tragic event that greatly scarred Betty Kaunda was the cold-blooded killing of her third-born son, Wezi, in what many, including the Kaunda family, believed was a political assassination. Betty Kaunda was also a moralist and believed women were not supposed to wear trousers. She saw to it that no female wore trousers in her home, including her two daughters, Cheswa and Musata. After UNIP lost elections in 1991 to the MMD, she maintained a calm stature during the following years of struggles when her husband was imprisoned several times during the 1990s. Betty Kaunda talked highly of her relationship with her husband. Dr. Kaunda usually preferred calling her my girl, although she objected to being called this in her later years. Betty, on the other hand, like most people surrounding President Kaunda, usually called him by his assumed title, the old man or Washkulu. Dr. Kaunda always sang the love song Pagan Moon to Betty to express his love for her. Dr. Kaunda learned the song from his Polish teacher in 1941 and sang it for Betty during their brief courtship and the countless times thereafter, on her birthday, on his birthday, and any celebration where he had an opportunity to sing. And of course, on the very last night that they ever spoke to each other. For over four decades, Betty Kaunda herself had been a diabetic, a condition that later in her life had called her to suffer a stroke, making her movements difficult and confining her to a wheelchair for most part of her later life. Betty Kaunda died in the early hours of 19 September 2012 in Harare, Zimbabwe, whilst visiting one of her daughters. She was 83 years old and was survived by her husband, eight children, 30 grandchildren and 11 great-grandchildren.